this brings us to our third event. And it is found in Luke chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders and spake unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority doest thou these things? Or who is he that gave thee this authority? And he answered and said unto them, I will ask ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then believe ye not him? But if we say of men, all the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. And they answered that they could not tell whence it was. And Jesus said unto them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So Jesus was teaching in the temple courts, which here is the court of the Gentiles. So this event would probably be on a Tuesday. But only Luke only tells us that it just happened on one of those days. It happened on one of those days that as he was teaching and preaching the good news, the religious leaders confronted him. They knew he was returning, so they were there waiting for him. And so the high priest probably included Caiaphas, Caiaphas and Annas, the scribes, the elders of the people, which are the members of the Sanhedrin. So they were already there in the temple waiting for him to come back. So they came upon him suddenly and unexpectedly. They caught the people off guard. Uh, they were The religious leaders were pretty much troubled at him cleansing the temple. They did not like him teaching and preaching in the temple. They did not like people coming to hear him. And they definitely... Then I like the boys in the temple praising him as the son of David. And with all this, they asked him, by what authority does he have to do these things? So they confronted him to demand an answer. They wanted to hear what he has to say. They wanted him to explain to them what authority did he have to enter the temple and to do as he pleases? He came to expel people. He came to heal people. He came to teach. He came to preach the gospel. So not only do they demand what right does he have to do these things, but they pretty much want to know who gave him that authority. And you remember just a few years earlier when he cleansed the temple, they asked him the same question. That's found in John 2.18. So they said, what authority do you have to do these things? So he turns it around on them. He answers their question with a question. You know, it reminds me of growing up. We would ask my dad a little question. It required a simple yes or no answer. So he would, he, you know, if a question would be a yes, he would ask a question, was well, the sky blue? And you would say yes. So he would pretty much answered your question by asking you a question, which in turn, guess what? You answered your own question. So the religious leaders, uh, Jesus turned around on them by asking them a question. So his question is about John's baptism. He wants to know what they have to say about it. If they will say to him what, uh, what they think about his question, if they will answer it, then he will in turn answer them. So now Jesus is demanding an answer from them. He wants them to respond to his question. But if they do not have anything to say about John's baptism, then he will not say anything about his authority. So now the religious leaders, they try to trap Jesus, but in turn or trap themselves. They try to accuse him now they stand accused. They are looking to condemn him. And now they are condemned. So his question is about 
the authority of John the Baptist. And they come and ask him by his authority. Now he turned around and asked him by John's authority to baptize. So they reasoned among themselves. So they kind of talked about this. Of, you know, they weighed out their options. I guess you would say, they would say, well, if we say this, then he's going to say that. And they said, well, if we answer it this way, then, then you know, then this is going to happen. But their response was, they really didn't, well, the response, they didn't know. They couldn't say. But the truth is, it's not that they didn't know. They just didn't want to admit the truth. They did not want to say where John's authority came from. And so Jesus said, Neither will I tell you what authority I'll do these things. And this is only a first of a series of questions uh, that they present to Jesus during this last week. And so the last event we're going to look at today is Jesus' la uh, last Passover. And that's found in Luke 22, verses 1 through 20. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes saw how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way, and communed with the chief priests and captain, captains, how he, might, be, how he bet might betray him unto them. And they were glad, and covenanted to give him money, and he promised and sought opportunity, opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when you are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in. And he shall say unto the good men of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is thy guest chamber, that I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room, upper room furnished. There, make ready. And they went in, and found as he said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat it thereof, until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and said, Take this, and divide it among yourself. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread, and gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. So the plot to kill Jesus is beginning to unfold. Luke tells us that the festival on unleavened bread, which is called the Passover, is drawing near. Mark tells us there are two days before Passover, Mark 14, 1. The Feast of Unleavened Bread usually followed after the Passover, and the two were usually celebrated as one event. Uh, while, the, while the world was looking forward to Passover, the disciples were dreading this day. The world was excited to celebrate this feast. And the disciples were, were about to lose their friend and their teacher. The world does not know what is about to happen in a couple days. The high priest, the scribes, the elders of the people met at the court of the high priest determining how they might seize Jesus, looking for that opportunity to put him to death. But they couldn't do so because they feared the people. And at this point, Satan enters Judas. So now this is Judas' time. And so he will, Satan's plan to put Jesus to death 
has come. He's been plotting this for thousands of years. And now he thinks he can accomplish this. And he's going to use Judas to do that. So this was not some random thought that came to Judas's mind. This was not some evil desire that was in his heart. This was Satan's purpose being revealed through him. Mm. So now Judas is turning into a traitor. The gospel writers have hinted at this throughout their gospels. If you notice when you read the accounts of the apostles, some of them will put uh, Judas, surname Iscariot, uh, who will betray Jesus or he's a traitor. So they pretty much hinted throughout the gospels that he is a traitor. So while the religious leaders were plotting scheming, trying to figure out how they're going to do this. Judas is now going to meet them and he's going to tell them or discuss with them what he will do. So he is betraying Jesus and he's going to discuss and how he's going to do this. The religious leaders were filled with joy. They got somebody who's going to do their dirty work. They found somebody who's willing to do it. Not that they found them, but somebody came and is willing to do their dirty work, and they're willing to pay for this. They agreed to 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. So Judas is using Jesus as a bargaining chip. He said, what will you give me if I give him up to you? But what's so bad about this? is the fact that 30 pieces of silver is a price of an injured slave. So this shows how much value they placed upon Jesus. And this is fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy in Zechariah 11, 12. If you think good, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. They did not ask how much he wanted. And to Judas, he didn't care. As long as he got paid. He was willing to do it. I think he was willing to do it even if he didn't get paid. That pretty much shows how much hatred he had toward Jesus. So he promised to betray him. But not while the crowds were around. So they decided not to do anything until the feast was over. Uh, they no longer needed a plot. Now they must wait to the right time to hear word from Judas. So Judas was seeking that right, favorable, or convenient time to betray Jesus. So he had to find that time when Jesus would be alone. And that would be the place that he would betray him. I don't know if you thought about it, but Judas was among the crowd as Jesus was entering into Jerusalem. He was one of them that was throwing his clothes out, throwing uh, Along with those who threw out palm branches, he was singing Hosanna in the highest, praising him. And now he's betraying him. He's turning his back on Jesus. So the Passover is prepared, and the disciples and Jesus are celebrating, celebrating it. This time, during this time, Judas gets up. You remember, Jesus tells Judas what you're planning on doing, you do it quickly. And the disciples were kind of confused about what was going on. So Judas leaves from the Passover. He goes against the troops, rounds up the religious leaders. And so Jesus uses this time to teach his disciples the true meaning of the Passover. And here, he will institute the Lord's Supper, also known as Communion. Even though the Passover is technically a day away, but they were celebrating it um, a day early, it seems. But the way it's figured out, according to many commentaries, is depending on the time frame. But one of them says that Jesus and the area where Jesus and the disciples live went by the Roman standard of time, which went from sunrise to sunrise, which means that they were able to celebrate. Passover at sunset on this particular day. 
So this gave them the freedom to celebrate the Passover a day early. So this final meal will be a memorable, a memorable one. Even though the disciples will learn something about each other, and they, of course, learn who would betray Jesus, and they began to argue with who's going to be the greatest, and Jesus uses this as an object lesson, says, you know what? I'm going to show you what it means to be great. And you must humble yourself and be a servant in order to be great. So he's going to uh, teach them this. Judas is gone. And Jesus will use the Passover elements to teach them about the Lord's Supper. So he reveals the meaning of this meal. He will use the bread and the wine to do so. So he takes the bread, the whole loaf of bread, and breaks it. He didn't cut it, he broke it, which symbolized his broken body for the disciples and for us. The cup symbolizes his shed blood, which is poured out for them. So Jesus is showing them that his body will be broken and his blood will be poured out so that they can be forgiven and so that those who come after them will also be forgiven of our sins. But the, the bread and the wine do not literally become the body and the blood. It is only a symbolic a representation to remind us of what Christ did for us. He gave his life so we could be forgiven, so we can have eternal life. One thing to note, his blood was not spilled, it was poured out. When you spill something, it usually means that it was an accident. But Jesus' blood was poured out, meaning it was intentional. So why do we celebrate communion? Well, we celebrate it to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross and to proclaim his death until he comes. So you can see that in 1 Corinthians 11, 26. Jesus revealed this to the disciples. And so in order for them to pass it on to other believers, and so in, in, in turn, they could pass it on to other believers. And it's been going on for thousands of years. We celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, as a rem uh, remembrance of what Christ did for us. The betrayal probably happened on Wednesday. And the institution of the Lord's Supper happened on Thursday. So basically, it's possible that Judas went on Wednesday talking to the religious leaders, getting his money to betray Jesus. And then now the institution of the Lord's Supper with the other disciples happened on Thursday. It'll be this night in which Jesus will be arrested, tried, and crucified. But as I mentioned a little while ago, this is not the end of the story. So this does not mean that we, as I heard somebody said years ago that they were witnessing to some, uh, a missionary was witnessing to some people, and they got to the part where Jesus was crucified, and the person broke down crying. But he rejoiced when they got to the part where Jesus was raised, from the dead. It was a long night. That night, but joy cometh in the morning, and joy came that Easter morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Gospels. We thank you that you preserved your word for these thousands of years while we can read it ourselves. We thank you, Lord, that that you, that you sent Jesus to come. We thank you that he shed his blood on Calvary so we could be forgiven. And Lord, we know that power continues into our day. And Lord, we pray that during this Easter season that millions more will continue to come to Christ and trust in that precious blood that was shed upon the cross. And Lord, that they would die to themselves and they would trust in Christ 
as our Lord and Savior. We pray, Lord, you continue to work in our hearts and our lives. Pray that you continue to be with us. Pray that you continue to lead and guide and direct. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.